Good evening. Welcome to the Museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Series. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. It is my honor to introduce Matteo Aueyo, who will present the book Curating Italian Fashion, Heritage, Industry, Institutions. Matteo will present his latest monograph in which he investigates the crucial role played by the industry in the preservation and promotion of Italian fashion heritage. After a conversation, Matteo will be available to sign books uh, next to the stage. I ask you to please silence your devices and please join me in welcoming Matteo. Thanks for coming. Um, I think I'm, I'm liking to think that this is the last presentation of the book, so I, I wrote exactly what I wore on the cover, uh, which got me into trouble with a few academics. Um, but, you know, it made sense to me that I should be on the cover of the book. Um, and I'm going to try and um, convince you to buy it, basically. That's <laughs> the plan for tonight. Um, so, the... Um, the idea behind this, uh, this book comes from a, from a PhD that I started um, a few years ago at London College of Fashion. And uh, I had been working even before that in Italian um, institutions that were dedicated to textile history and to uh, fashion history. In particular, the foundation created by Antonio Ratti in Comunal. You have the Antonio Ratti Textile Center at the at the Met, which I went the other day like a fangirl, like, oh my God, <laughs> finally seeing it. But um, I've been talking to so many people uh, who I think were my, I would call them my mentors. Uh, they really raised me as a, as a scholar. Um, and I could hear all of the stories about their exhibitions. Uh, you know, very often you, when you study as a historian, you know, you don't get the sense of what people's choices actually were like. And very often I would start, you know, going on massive critical reflections at how was the industry trying to connect and promote Italian fashion. And they were like, no, actually, my cousin was working in that company and they had some money spare and that's how we did the exhibition. And it was, I was trying to um, put everything together, both of the oral history, I'd say, and then what I had uh, uh, seen. And uh, it all started with one, one question. I was born and raised in Italy, um, um, in the town of Caravaggio, the painter. That's how I like to think I got my curls from. Uh, <laughs> that's a lie, but you know. Um, and uh, um, I moved to London to study fashion curation. Um, and of course, many of the examples there were connected to um, the UK, the Victorian Albert Museums, uh, exhibitions that were done here, uh, that were done at the Costume Institute. Um, and one of the questions was, is there such a thing as an Italian fashion curation? You know, could I even consider it? Um, at, at the beginning, we were thinking, you know, should be Italian fashion curation, the title of this book, and then curating Italian fashion seemed uh, more appropriate, because what I will try to show you is how uh, uh, different um, agents from members of the industry to independent scholars uh, to also superintendents and curator in uh, state archives uh, uh, looked at Italian fashion and its history and its contemporary production and how led, that led to specific uh, curatorial strategies. So the book is divided into five sections. Uh, at the beginning I start talking about how um, the Renaissance was a central um, imagery to develop Italian fashion identity. Uh, this has been written extensively, but also started already from the 1950s, uh, there were, and even before, there were exhibitions uh, used uh, to present that imagery of Renaissance and to associate the golden age of Italian art and kind of provide kudos to uh, then contemporary Italian designs. Uh, um, so I try to explain how basically uh, using the, the, the perspective of heritage marketing and uh, Renaissance as a main narrative and how companies already in, well, Rosa Genoni, a uh, fantastic dressmaker at the beginning of the 20th century was what I would say doing heritage marketing. In this particular case, this is an exhibition in Milan, an international exhibition. 
1906, and she was advocating for Italian fashion, for a, for a fashion that should be Italian away from, you know, Parisians, you know, we want to have our own identity, uh, we don't want to be slaves. Um, but it wasn't nationalistic uh, in, a, in a fascist sense. That would come uh, a, few, a few years later. Uh, she genuinely was interested in um, kind of tapping into what was uh, a sense of nation that was really developing across multiple countries at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. And she did a collection of garments that in terms of design and the actual silhouette are not necessarily groundbreaking or away from Parisian fashions, but they thought, okay, let's just put uh, some embroidery that looked like uh, the Primavera, the Spring by Botticelli. This is the fancy historical equ uh, equivalent of a David printed on an apron, which you can buy basically anywhere in Italy if you're a tourist. Um, and. Uh, uh, this was you know, an attempt which won uh, a, gold, um, a gold medal at the time, but it was kind of a one-off uh, um, event perhaps, like, or Rosa Genoni herself uh, was an advocate that didn't kind of bring in a whole school of thought. Um, it, we would need some time to travel through that, but that, that's the beginning of the book. Then I moved to uh, look at uh, what is industrial heritage in Italy. Um, it's possibly the um, most boring chapter, chapter two, but we had to go through it just to, you know, imagine I had to actually read it because I wrote it. I would skip it, you know. Um, it's the one without images, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not by chance. Uh, but you know, basically what, what, what happened in Italy is that industrial heritage um, was not necessarily supported or valued by the Italian state. There was so much artistic heritage and in a more traditional sense of the fine arts. So money and, and efforts went to preserve that. So companies had to develop their own uh, strategies to support and to reflect on their own histories. And they had been doing that for a long time. So Italian fashion companies or textile companies when I, when I say fashion, I usually refer to as uh, the, all, all of these systems together. They were not doing something that was not done for product design or for uh, companies that were dealing with producing electricity. Um, and that was needed, uh, that chapter is needed to understand the kind of landscape and the influences. And in fact, they had outstanding um, in the 1950s, you would find outstanding institutions that were supporting uh, the heritage of an industry. They were, at the time, not like we do today, we present the past and the present together to kind of provide authority to what we are doing. They would say, we do projects on the past and then our work is on the present. They would keep them separate. So we would say they were looking at the history of their field rather than heritage in the sense of using the past for present. And one of these outstanding institutions was created by a textile company, an enormous textile company, uh, Snia Viscosa, was working with Viscos. It was one of the biggest textile producers in Italy. Also, they had a lot of money. And they created an institution in 1951 called uh, the International Center of the Arts and of Costume. They really loved uh, very long names. We'll get even longer acronyms uh, as we'll go over this night. Uh, but this is a poster from 1952, and this was in Venice. Um, there were different cities in Italy, that there still are the cities, but every city was kind of claiming um, a throne of Italian fashion. Or we started high fashion, or we started industrial fashion, not going into um, um, kind of, you know, this internal fight. But in Venice, this institution thought, oh, we'll present, uh, we'll look at fashion, we'll look at cinema, we'll also organize historical reenactment because that was a major thing at the time, especially for tourists. Uh, in a way, if we are selling Italy based on its golden history, we've got to put that on display. Um, and so that's where my, my, my 
history starts. So the, the third chapter um, basically tries to provide an overview of the 20th century and Italian fashion exhibitions and institutions, uh, and which I've divided into three phases. Um, the study of historical text, textiles and dress um, from the 1950s to the 1970s. Then there was a shift in the 1980s, which um, even here with the famous or infamous Yves Saint Laurent exhibition uh, um, at the Costume Institute of bringing in contemporary designers. And then in the noughties, we will start seeing how companies are actually taking the lead. And I say that they are no longer sponsors, but they become cultural producers. They have thought, okay, this is an, basically, it's an investment. So why would I give so much money to projects if I'm not sure on the return of the investment? I can create foundations where I will have full control of uh, what I will get back. So almost kind of writing exhibitions as press releases, and that will reserve a higher return of investment, uh, which is, could sound problematic if you're connecting it to uh, research and scholarship and fashion, but I found great examples of uh, commercial intent being um, addressed at the same time as developing scholarship in a, in a very transparent way, which is what I'd like to show you. This is a great look that I'm sweating so much. <laughs> um, anyway, moving forward, these are some images taken from the catalogues of the first exhibition, telling you about long names, they, they thought our exhibition should have a longer title than the name of our institutions, so <laughs> it was an exhibition of costume in time from the Hellenic era to romanticism, everything. Of course, from a Western perspective, um, but the, the settings were actually gorgeous. Um, they had uh, um, fabrics, produced by the company who had uh, created uh, the institution, used as settings for the exhibition display. Um, that is Palazzo Grassi, where it was held. It's still today an exhibition venue, but by another association. And uh, they even had books on, on costume that were on display. He wa they wanted it to become um, a research center and they wanted to basically create a manifesto exhibition. This is all the things that we'll be able to, to look at. And um, scholarship on textiles, um, and, and especially on historical dress, was a big, just beginning in Italy. You know, there were some examples here and there. Um, and uh, this was also a way of getting people together, and they did in 1952, the first Congress, International Congress of History of Costume. Like, this was my version of Beyonce's Coachella. When I saw the lineup, uh, I was dead. Like, you had James Lava, keeper of prints and drawings at the V&A. Um, then you had Francois Boucher, who was a convener. Doris Langley-Moore, who would establish the Museum of Fashion in Bath, was one of the speakers. And so it was, it was really amazing. Like, I wish I had been there. And um, the organizers were the owners of Sina Viscosa, that company. But the level, the level of, uh, of scholarship, they just wanted to get the top. And uh, Doris Langley Moore, at the time the museum, um, museum of Fashion in Bath was called Museum of Costume of London, um, she said that Chuck, this association, was the first organization with international perspective. In her opinion, the only correct conception with regards to fashion. So it showed to me that there was uh, a sense of uh, recognition from authorities, authoritative voices at the time, that they were doing something quite unique. And then there was only one Italian speaker there. Uh, her name was Rosita levi Pizetsky. Uh, she is the author of the book at the center. Uh, she was a self-taught historian. Um, she, she, I like to think that she was bored, um, and she had a very wealthy husband, and she started collecting and studying, and collecting and studying. Uh, her collection actually is still part of the, the civic collection in Milan. And uh, um, she published a book at the same time of two other books that if you're into fashion or dress history, you would know. Francois Boucher, 
Histoire de Costume, 1965, and then A Concise History of Costume by James Lava in 1969. These are individual books. Boucher's is quite hefty. She wrote a five-volume encyclopedia of costume, like, <laughs> call it a statement. And then no one ever talked about it. I mean, not even, I think no one wanted to read <laughs> something that long. But what, was, uh, what I found charming is, charming, interesting or curious is that how, by looking up bibliographies, of later projects. This book was never mentioned. And that was one of the things that I always wondered, you know, when I was studying uh, text in English. Of course, m most people might not speak Italian, but a lot of great scholars uh, would not know, be aware of any of the research done in Italy, despite Italy being a major player, uh, at least of the textile production from the 1920s and then of fashion production from later on. So it was like, you know, how, wh why, why did that get lost? Uh, so that was one of the, my, my obsessions. But what they were also doing at the time of that Congress was an exhibition called um, The Legend of the Golden Thread uh, on the, the, the Silk Roots, uh, an even longer title like that. And we're gonna get even longer, I promise. Um, Half of the presentation is just exhibition titles. Um, this is a catalog at the time, and the last two rooms uh, were called The Researchers on the left, and then uh, The Miracle of Science on the right. Uh, they looked like futuristic, you know, that's what the future looked like in 1950s. Um, and what, what was brilliant, I think, for me is that they already by year two, the institution starts, or the industry that's behind that institution starts putting their agenda forward. Okay, let's also talk about the present. All of that we need to validate what we are doing now. Uh, and the exhibition display were actually brilliant. But then of course, as it usually happens in all of the best uh, Italian textile or fashion dynasties, succession, we have a problem. Uh, the Sansa want to do something different from their fathers. So when um, Franco Marinotti, the son of Paolo the founder, um, started to take over effectively of the institution, they thought, mm, I'm more interested in contemporary art. So we're moving away from textiles and, uh, and dress. Uh, they continued doing contemporary fashion collection, the kind of displays, almost like fashion weeks, festivals, they were called. And then, instead, they, they used the space to create um, art, contemporary art exhibition where there were artworks commissioned and created using fabrics of the company that was sponsoring them, at the same time using those textiles to do very exhibition design across, uh, across the venue. Um, and this were actually, they did some interesting uh, collaboration with other European contemporary art institutions uh, in the late 1950s and in the 1960s. Um, but then somehow it kind of died down. The company also was having different um, income and they had other priorities. And what happened in the 1960s is that exhibition-wise, the, the strategy was to focus on contemporary art, but scholarship would continue on dress and fashion, well, textile collection, and in fact, one of my favorite books ever, 1970, this was the International Guide to Public Museums and Collections of Costumes and Textiles. This was a three-language book, Italian, English, and French, edited by Grazietta Butazzi, who's a hero of mine. She was basically the founding uh, scholar uh, who, from the 1960s to the 1990s, so she basically got a lot of other dress scholars together and tried to uh, stimulate exchanges of practice to learn how to approach the study of textile and fashions. And she wrote this outstanding um, collection. Uh, well, it's, it's basically an inventory uh, with m more than 700 collection on all of the continents, still in parallel, I haven't seen an uh, a publication of this kind, but this is never mentioned. I've only found it mentioned in two other publications. Even people who knew this woman, they didn't know about this book. 
So again, all of these mysteries, you know, what, what happened then? But um, I, what, I'm not sure why this didn't travel. Perhaps uh, it's a number of reasons why it wasn't produced. It, it wasn't published. There were a few. It, it wasn't promoted at events. They were not traveling to international um, conferences, which were happening, but more, more focused on textiles. But what definitely happens is that by 1970s, uh, there starts to be uh, the willingness to think how to study textiles and how to study uh, historical dress in Italy. So a number of uh, um, scholars, this is the longest acronym, they get together in 1978 and they decide that after a few years of organizing uh, um, short courses, uh, so a person who had developed an expertise in um, Renaissance Florentine velvets would hold a four-day course where everybody would travel to. And this is suddenly kind of this very scattered uh, development of knowledge uh, study bring the field of uh, textile and dress history forward. But they got together in 1978, creating an association called the Italian Center for the Study of the History of Textiles, uh, uh, called the CHIST, they all spoke about this. They were 26 Italian historians of applied art, and in particular of textiles, costumes, and lace. They loved putting lace away from the rest. I don't know, there must have been some internal <laughs> thing that I haven't delved into that. Well, uh, we lace, thank you very much. Um, so they were got together by the need to build an organism to unite the efforts of individuals in an attempt to influence the current situation of the Italian textile heritage. This is all my translations. Like, wow, that's brilliant. And then they, because they, some of them were in positions of power, one was a curator of applied arts at Pitti Palace, which was a decorative, um, um, basically a decorative art foundation connected to institution connected to the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. They could hold have exhibition spaces, and uh, textiles were basically included in other collections. Some of them were ecclesiastical, depending on, on, on how the collections were formed. They were internal, and they were able to create new collections by taking bits and pieces from the rest and saying textiles and dress are the focus. So we get to my favorite image. You might have seen it on Instagram. We have a procession of catwalks of cardinals. Uh, this was 1979. Um, the title of the exhibition was Curiosity of a Palace, uh, uh, the events from the wardrobes of Palazzo Pitti. Like, um, and uh, what they did was to have quite fashionable display. Uh, if you see behind this catwalk, there was actually an arch with luminaries, like it was really camp. Um, <laughs> and I find it so, like if, even to this day, some people would, in, in Italy would, would, would question the taste of, uh, of dealing with ecclesiastical matters, but like, not, like we, we, we're going for it. Um, and uh, this was a way, as they told me, to test uh, uh, how the audience would react. So we have two exhibitions between 1979 and 1980 where they are trying to test whether the idea of a fashion museum would be welcome by the audience and what visitors' number would be. Guess what? They liked it. The audience really liked it, and so there was one in Florence and the other one was in Milan. Uh, this is even uh, not better, I should say, but um, to me, um, uh, it's one of the most um, challenging um, exhibitions done from a political perspective on fascism, but through the angle of fashion. This is 1980, and they decided we are going to approach fascism, the 20 year of the fascist uh, dictatorship in Italy, 1922 to 1943. But we're just going to talk about the garment. So it was a great way at the time uh, to talk about a very problematic subject, but with a safe distance. And uh, um, it also, you know, you would have Ferragamo, uh, all of the autarky, uh, the self-sufficiency um, designs that, that were developed at the time. And uh, uh, the installation was actually um, pretty outstanding and modern in the way that it was created. And this was a private museum 
in Milan uh, who had an enlightened director who said, let's come here and we're going to do it. And this title was even longer. So 20, it was 1922, 1943, 20 years of Italian fashion, a proposal for a fashion museum in Milan. This was the actual title of the exhibition. And they even had a conference at the end of the exhibition to decide what they were, if, if they were able to do it. But of course, you know, eagles got in the way, and we have big ones in Italian fashion. Uh, and they weren't that big yet, you know, imagine now. Um, so that's the answer to the question why we don't have a proper fashion museum, <laughs> just right away. But, uh, you know, th these were great um, um, experiments, which then led to some more. Uh, in 1985, inspired by the Yves Saint Laurent exhibition, they did an exhibition of Salvatore Ferragamo, the, the shoemaker, but, and, but I've taken an extract from the foreword. In my research, I spend so much time reading forewords, uh, something that no one ever does, um, but you know, if you don't have any friends, you've got to kill time. Um, uh, and, uh, but the idea is that that's where you find uh, a document to what the sponsor thought. Why they, of course, they are very ornate pieces of writing, and whenever you find a sponsor writing, you know, kind of, they have to say why they are giving money to the arts, they start the Medici. Just like the Medici, we're always, uh, <laughs> we're always going back there. Like, keeping up with the Medici should be a fantastic series on sponsorship. <laughs> uh, I will do it one day, but they, they wrote this. Um, the cut um, with a perspective, which we can define even scientific, and uh, they use quotation marks. Uh, with all due respect to physics, chemistry, mathematics, you know, we fashion people <laughs> are not that clever, is undoubtedly favored by the fact that the life of Ferragamo is now completed and fully consigned to history. He's dead. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> that's a very nice way to say he is dead, so we could do it. And in fact, they made sure that they wrote 1960, so they know that we are not promoting an Italian functioning company, you know. Um, and uh, these were some of, uh, th there are many surviving images of, of that exhibition, uh, but it started uh, the work on the Ferragamo archive, which was already fairly organized, which then would lead to the opening of the first corporate museums on fashion in Italy by the Ferragamo in 1995. And the director, who was one of the curators at this exhibition is still there, and she's fantastic, Stefania Ricci. Um, and together with supporting this practice, what they also did was to organize events um, and uh, conferences, uh, uh, this association of historians, which grew. It was basically, they had um, committees per each region. There was a national assembly once a year, and then they had uh, subcommittees that would be self-directed. Um, and they did one, my favorite, conference in 1990, three days, called Ready-Made Fashion, Research and Problems on the History of Ready-Made. So they were going back to the Middle Ages uh, uh, to kind of understand what would uh, be a history of actually, uh, not couture, but what would other people, well, cheaper made garments. And this was created after Grazietta Butazzi, that historian that I was telling you about, was tasked by GFT, um, Gruppo Finanziario Tessile, the manufacturer behind Armani, um, to do corporate research on their archives, and then they realized that perhaps there was something going on on the industrialization of clothing manufacture. Uh, and then they got the idea and the money from the company to do this amazing um, catalog that the, the, the proceedings were published two years after in the original language of the, well, in the language of the original contributions. And uh, it was published in 1992, supported again by the company. They also had a journal in 1990 called uh, Textile Art. We could talk about why we have to put the word art uh, to provide validation, but not today. Um, 
But actually, Alessandra Mottola Molfino, the director of the museum where they had the fascist fashion exhibition, she wrote this. The members, the national board of directors, the regional secretariats, the president of this association, while aiming above all to the knowledge of ancient textiles for reasons of survival of these, have however always held contacts of mutual exchange even with contemporary production of fabrics and fashion and with its operators saying, we need money. And we are saying it quite clearly, in the future with the support of our patrons, including also manufacturing companies which are increasingly interested in the history of textiles, we would like to start some targeted research. So they were also called, okay, we now got just your money, uh, but now we want to also look into your archives. There was really a sense of, of exchange. And when I was talking to, to these scholars, they were saying you know, most of the time, um, it was just, I know this person, we want to do a small publication, they could give us two million liras, because at this time, Italian uh, textile and fashion manufacturing were really making so much money. So they say they would give you money without even questioning. Um, the good old days. Um, but you know what, what, I, what I was fascinated about was the transparency with which this exchange between industry and scholarship, as I call in the book, was always there. Uh, rather than a separation, it, you know, should fashion be in the exhibition, there's always this debate, very boring debate about separating the two. They're like, you know, they, they are making money, but we can still have um, contribution to scholarship. And uh, this is a very boring slide, but what I wanted to put forward is um, GFT, Armani Group, the president was Marco Rivetti, who was also the president of Pitti Immagine, the fair in Florence, uh, which had created a publishing house that was producing the catalog of the trade fairs as well as the academic journals. It was the same people and the same exchanges. One day I was you know, starting to put everything on a, on a board. Um, sponsors in the buildings, that's another series. And uh, uh, you could see that that was a very tight network of exchanges between all of these people. And uh, Marco Rivetti in particular was an enlightened entrepreneur who really wanted to use scholarship and exhibitions to promote contemporary fashion because we have a problem there in the 1990s. The problem is Florence is no longer the center of fashion. Uh, it kind of had lost uh, a lot of its centrality and so there was um, an effort to put Florence back on the map. How do you do that? How can you put Florence back on the map of Italian fashion? You do an exhibition and you call it La Sala Bianca, which happens to be in Florence, the birth of Italian fashion. And you just use a retrospective exhibition to say, ah, that's where you start the history. So we're back there. Again, this idea of heritage marketing. Um, and so they, they commissioned this exhibition. Um, there are two catalogues. One is, let's say, a publication that was accompanying the exhibition research, but was not about what was actually on display. And then they did a smaller uh, publication, the one that you see on the right, with exhibition of what was actually on display, because some fashion scholars really wanted that you know, precise communication of scholarship. And uh, that was loud, sorry. They started, Pitti started to uh, commission a series of exhibitions uh, in conjunction with the trade fair that were taking place in Florence, still happening to this day. They started that collection. So the audience are people that are coming for, uh, for the fairs. It's no longer a general audience. Perhaps the main audience is not even the scholars, but is um, fashion traders. So we also find very interestingly that we have a new uh, curatorial approach, we can say that exhibitions are not tools to disseminate research, but they are platforms for uh, fashion criticism done in, a, in an exhibition way. So it's not the result of five years of research on a collection. 
um, which takes place when the curators are actually carers of, of a specific collection and they spend time studying it. We have independent curators who are coming in, selecting objects from different, um, different locations. And in a way, what they said, they were trying to create a commentary on the trends. This is what's happening in fashion right now that we see in the trade fair. And on the other hand, you have an exhibition that kind of unpacks some of the themes in conjunction, throws out some suggestions or clues on how to read contemporary fashion. Um, and then in 1996, they have their, their moment. Uh, now, this is Italian ego at its best. Let's do a biennale of fashion. And um, it's not ego for that. It was a brilliant idea. Uh, Germano Celant was one of the uh, standing arch contemporary art curator was one of the um, uh, of the curators, but they took over the whole city of Florence. They spent so much money that really they had some financial issues. Apparently, of course, there are not many documents about that. Or I, I was told this, but without going too much into detail. But I think it's a good point because there was another edition two years after. This was supposed to be about it, fashion and art. The one after is fashion and film. But Cheland said in the, in, the, in the catalog, there are actually so many different catalogs of this, but he says, why should um, there be a biennale of cinema, of photography, um, of art, of, of sculpture, and not of fashion? They are also commercial, but there can also be some spaces for on how to use that that practice creatively, uh, so we have an equal right. In a way, we are putting fashion uh, on display, taking for granted that it's a serious thing and it's at the same level of the rest. Um, and what they did was to, they, they had an exhibition on art and fashion, then they asked designers to create installation in places scattered across the city. Um, I, I, I wasn't there, it's one of my, uh, saddest things, not having seen it. Uh, there are actually not many ex photographs of all of this installation. One of my favorite was the Gianfranco Ferre, which had this gigantic crinolines uh, in the Cappella Medicea floating as a, a kind of jellyfish. Um, and there's a reflection on space, on spirituality, on ecstasy. I mean, uh, you could really just l look into this and see how layered uh, this installation was. Perhaps not all of them were effective, but we are not here to, <laughs> to mention the bad examples today, although they're so much more interesting. Um, this is recorded, you know. <laughs> anyway, no shades, that's what I've been told. Um, um, but this was a, a one-off event. It didn't work on that scale, but actually, it was the starting point of more exhibition done in Florence that were leading more towards, we would say, fashion criticism and contemporary art than a traditional dress scholarship. We would have some exhibitions of designers. These are two dedicated to Gianni Versace, one with the most poetic title of all in 1989 called uh, L'abito per pensare. It means uh, uh, basically the dress used to think or dress for thought. Um, where they had this mannequin as a bust of uh, ancient classical bust. The looks of Versace and wonderful, and apparently they were hideous to, to mount garments on top of them. But it was a great exhibition in Milan that was considered uh, very thought out and bringing both scholarship as well as contemporary installation. And the other one was an exhibition done at Fondazione Ratti by the, the foundation of the silk manufacturer Antonio Ratti in Como, northern Italy. It's a district of silk production. But that was an exhibition that was done at the Met. It traveled to, to Italy. And then in Italy, they also had um, a satellite exhibition that was just on how Gianni Versace played with fabrics and the new commissions of fabrics. And this is something that you could only have put on display if you have the archive. If you, if you know the manufacturers who were working with such you had all of the documents. This is a story that a corporate institution can tell and perhaps a state museum wouldn't have collected all of that. So also, 
corporate institutions, or we could say corporate projects, start to understand that they have a voice, and that voice can tell stories that others can't tell. And uh, I've got to run. Um, I always like the older days. But uh, this is another exhibition done in um, Florence in 1998. Uh, it was called um, The Engine of Fashion. Uh, there was um, a committee set up called the Fashion Engineering Unit, and I think someone in the audience was part of that committee. Uh, and uh, Valerie Seal, um, and uh, um, we'll have to talk about that. I always loved the name Fashion Engineering Unit, um, but they and they 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 did three. Um, exhibitions uh, uh, under the name Janina Malossi was one of the curators uh, and project managers of that. Um, they, they started using a new place in Florence, which was an old train station, and they were um, kind of also exploring menswear, um, something that was associated with Pitti Trade Fair. They had done a menswear exhibition in 1993, and others wouldn't have done menswear. And this starts a series of uh, uh, contemporary um, exhibitions once a year or twice a year uh, that are used in, we could say, in dialogue with uh, contemporary production, supported and encouraged and stimulated and sometimes completely controlled by the companies. So the last uh, phase of this history that I'm putting forward, which is by no means exhaustive, but I was just trying to create an overall narrative, is the lead of corporate institutions over the last 20 years. 2001 is an important year, is the end of the Armani exhibition uh, here in New York, another infamous exhibition, but also uh, Uniform, Order and Disorder, which was created by, curated by Maria Luisa Frisa, Stefano Tonkin, Francesco Bonami at the Stazione Leopolda, always in Florence in that very location. Um, and, uh, even the catalogues look very different. These curators have exhibitions in, have experience uh, managing magazines. You can tell that um, we don't have the classical scholarly publication, but we have an object that works on its own and that is supposed to stimulate um, an audience that is not the audience of a state museum. Um, and then we also have a major exhibition in Como on silk the 20th century in Como, which got together all of the archives and the different manufacturers. Um, that's another brilliant one. But um, if you have a main foundation in Como uh, that bears the name of one manufacturer and you try to partner with other manufacturer, you can imagine that it's not going necessarily to work. It did at the time, but there is a beautiful essay by Chiara Bass, who was the curator, the director of the Textile Museum, the foundation, saying, a lot of companies are too young, they're not gonna allow access to their archives. Others, they have given away their archives because once you purchase a manufacturing plant, you're going to also give away the archive. And, there, and she explained a number of reasons why it's so difficult to reconstruct those histories, but also why we should have that discussion. And in this phase, you have publications by museums. I'm just gonna show you two. Uh, one is the Textile Museum in Prato, outside of Florence. That's a great uh, wool production um, tradition. Uh, and it, we could say it's a district local museum. Uh, it's not linked to one particular company, but it serves uh, uh, the local production associations. And the other one is the Ferragamo Museum. They both published a book celebrating 30 years of activity uh, within a few years, different, showing that these are institutions that no long, they're not only doing work to promote scholarship, but they are thinking. Uh, I want to review what I've done so far and I want to understand how to move forward. And this was the awareness that I needed to understand that we had entered a new phase. And they were saying in, in Prato that the museum has evolved as supporting and mirroring the profound changes of the social and economic context of the area. The museum should be, in a way, uh, the um, cultural center of that community. It's the platform where the, the local district can reflect 
uh, on how to move forward. Uh, so he plays an active role in contemporary production. So history has an active role in that production. And, but whether you're a single company or whether you are um, a district. If you think of Momu, uh, the museum in Antwerp, you could, you could view it also as a, as, as a local museum that is always in conversation and reflecting on what Antwerp fashion is. And they do exhibitions with an attitude that we could perhaps compare it to the values in which Antwerp fashion design is brought forward. Um, and uh, uh, this is the extract from the Ferragamo Museum. The museum is now a vehicle for the preservation of the memory of the founder, but also a communication tool of the brand on a worldwide level. And what I think was um, refreshing for me to see uh, that um, in practical terms, if we give him money away, we've got to have some return. Uh, we can still write um, a press release through an exhibition, but have some elements of uh, new scholarship. Not all places do that. Some of them are like just window display uh, and perhaps a waste of resources, uh, but others are managing to, to balance the two. This was my favorite exhibition at the Ferragamo. They, they were celebrating uh, 150 years of, of, the, of uh, Italian uh, unity. Um, what, what, yeah, it was an anniversary. Uh, it was called the Palace and the City, but they told this history of uh, the palace not about 900 years where the Ferragamo headquarters are. It happens if you work in a 13th century building, you know. Uh, <laughs> not anyone can do that. But they tell the story of a city, of a nation, and of a specific place. And then, of course, at the end of all of this amazing history, you have Ferragamo being there. So that provides cultural authority. But for every part of the exhibition, the museum would get the scholar the expert of the field that it's in discussed, and they commission them new research. So you're putting money towards contemporary scholarly production, and at the same time, you're serving your own needs. And if you go into a Ferragamo museum, you're not expecting them to be critical. The next step, I think, for me, is these places are great locations where companies can come to terms with their own limitations, and they can't do it on social media because there is a restricted uh, ability to, to, to elaborate on complex matters, but you can do it in an exhibition space. Um, the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Germany, they, they, they have Hitler's car, and they, I was talking to the director, and he would say, do we put that car on display or not? Because if we do, you might get people that go there as, uh, as a, almost an object of worship, but then if we don't do that, we are seen as uh, hiding a part of the history. So it's a constant compromise that you had to address. And museums are the best place where you can have that complexity. I'm finishing now. Yeah. Um, I'm done. No, no. Sorry, it was I'm done. No, <laughs> it's not that easy. Just... <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't get taken. You, you get a hook or something, just like in the old days. <laughs> no, um, well, you've got to buy the book if you know, want to know how the story ends. Uh, uh, but uh, the main point is uh, uh, there are multiple examples that I'm trying to charter uh, of different curatorial strategies that have developed in a specific way because of the context. Uh, um, and uh, they can also... Uh, although they were late in Italy, perhaps to do certain fashion exhibitions, uh, and they had to deal with the industry. This is something perhaps that other, uh, in other nations was not done, but it could be uh, we could have clues on how to reflect on this relationship between the sponsors, what they are doing, and how to use money in a corporate social responsibility way. We have all French brands are very good in creating heritage exhibitions. They travel around the world. Some of them are exquisitely curated and research. The next question is, is that the best way to use that money? But at least they are looking after a heritage that no one else is doing. In Italy, that, that's the part that, in my book, you will find 
um, many examples of when they got a state committee on how to create a fashion, a fashion museum and then nothing ever happens, you know, trying to get them together. And then, you know, we're very good at changing government quite quickly. Um, hopefully soon we'll see another change. Um, and, uh, and that kind of is also detrimental. So companies just did it themselves. Uh, uh, that is not the whole history of, uh, of Italian fashion curation, but it was part of it. Uh, is this the good way to do it? I'm not sure, but someone yesterday kind of gave me the answer. So, um, what about Italian fashion curation? And I thought that this explained very well. I went last night, I had to put Madonna in like this uh, uh, scholarship. So, thank you Madonna for using fashion as a way to convey very important and scholarly messages across the world uh, for many decades, and thank you for listening. So we have some questions. No one's asking for my number. Uh, you know. It's never too late to stop hoping. Okay. <laughs> Where could I learn more in depth into the history of Italian fashion? Now, uh, there are um, a few books about Italian fashion um, history. There are not that many in, in, in English um, that are trying to put everything together. But if anything, there are more books in English um, that are trying to give that overview, whereas in Italy they tend to focus on smaller parts. A, Italy has a very this a fragmented history. Um, uh, we have, was it Italian fashion style? Uh, the book, yeah, the, we have a good book exhibition, was it 10 years ago or even, even more? So that could be a starting point. Um, and my book is mostly on exhibition rather than, 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 than fashion, but there is a very long bibliographical list where you probably find a lot. Um, so I hope that that answers. I can give you some titles. Um, what scholars have inspired your research? Um, I, actually, we have two here, uh, with Valerie Steele. Uh, definitely inspired my work on Paris, and as a capital, thinking about geographies and the cultural construction of fashion. Um, Eugenia Paulicelli, who is also here, she wrote about Italianness, especially work on um, the Rosa Genoni, on the fascist era, and thinking about connecting uh, nationality, a sense of national identity and uh, um, fashion. And then Grazietta Butazzi, who actually, I'm just gonna go back, uh, um, I'm holding her book, uh, where well, she wrote many books. Uh, these were short books um, published in conjunction with, uh, with a newspaper, a famous one, um, um, a famous publisher actually, um, on different topics. You had the androgynous, you had the hero, you had uniforms, uh, and I picked the one that described me the most, which is the femme fatale. Um, but um, she wrote, she didn't, there is one book called Fashion, um, art history society. I can't remember the title in English, but it was translated. Um, and uh, Madonna, too, scholar. Um, this is a highly creative story narrative. Um, what might you look at next? Away from it? Um, no, um, I'm. I'm actually lo looking into Caravaggio, the painter, um, with um, what I want to do um, is to, we have the archives of the, the, the notebooks of Grazietta Butazzi at the Foundation Ratti in Como. So you have, you know, scholars you like and you have all of her working books with their notes, with cutouts of the images like gold. And uh, I really want to, to, to do something about her way of working and get younger scholars to reflect on that way of operating, which was purely analogic. So that's where I'll be doing next. Um, um, and then, oh, fabulous presentation, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what is your next project? Well, th 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 this, was the, this was the question. And then, uh, is there an Italian article of clothing that has sparked 
the backbone of your research. Wow, uh, this is an, an item. Um, I wouldn't say n no, but there is one exhibition, which is the one I did, and yeah, sorry for changing so ah, ugly, but there is one exhibition about one single garment called the white shirt as a symbol of uh, kind of middle class appropriateness. But this were all of their interpretation by Gianfranco Ferre, amazing Italian designer. And the whole exhibition was just about the white shirts and all of its reinterpretation. It was beautiful. I think I'm not the audience of fashion exhibition because I go there and I look too many details. But this is the one where I, I was um, um, speechless uh, because it was so beautiful. You had this ghost kind of floating up in midair. But you also had tables at the side with the drawings and, and, uh, and samples of the fabric, so you could get the creative process, but also you get the wow moment. Uh, so, and there is a catalogue also translated in English about this. I'll be signing copies of the book. You can take a picture of the author and the cover. It's not here, but it's a unique chance, really. You know, I don't live in the continent. <laughs> Thank you very much again, and I'll see you later.